Well, good morning, everyone. Um, glad you made it here to Jackson. Of course, I'm Greg Judy. Uh, we uh, ranch in uh, central Missouri. Uh, it's halfway between uh, St. Louis and Kansas City. And uh, we do have a really nice area to, to run livestock on because we are in the rolling hills. So about five miles east of us, it's all prairie. And so we actually don't have to compete with all the row croppers. Um, with all the subsidies that the government's handing out today, you just can't, it's hard to compete with those guys. And so we're in the rolling hills where there's not a lot of cropping. And so we're able to get these leases on some of this land. And if you're just starting out and you're looking for land to lease, that would be something that I would really make a mark on is try and find an area where you're not having to bid cash. You know, these, these row croppers can give a cash rent of, you know, 150 to $250 an acre. You can't do that. You've got to find these rolling hills that they can't crop or get away from large cities. And that's what we've done. I grew up in this area. I was fortunate. Um, it is home to me. And uh, I'll get more into that on the leasing the land part. But we've been pretty successful in obtaining leases. And we were forced to. I mean, we didn't have any money. Uh, we were going broke. And I realized, you know, I had to do something different than my neighbors. And I was following all the professionals, what they told me to do. And at the end of the year, uh, there wasn't any money left in my pocket. Everybody else had it. And so I'm a real big uh, proponent on trying to keep as much money on the farm as possible. And we're going to talk about that in the next couple of days of how our journey has brought us to where we are at today. And a lot of it had to do with, uh, a lot of it has to do with the philosophy and your, your daily life and the way you believe uh, you've got to be willing to do what other people won't do. You've got to be able to accept ridicule because you are going to be made fun of because you're different. That's a big one. That's a hard one for people to get over. Um, we still are different in our community. Everybody looks at us like we're nuts. And um, I like that. And I think you need to adopt that kind of mentality. You've got to have this mentality that if the neighbors aren't talking about you, you're probably stagnant. You are. You've fallen back into this groove, and you're not really challenging ideas outside the box. And I think that's huge. I think we need to have young people around us. Um, we have an internship program, and Jan and I didn't have any children. And so we like bringing in young people to teach the next generation how to farm successfully, ranch successfully. And we need more young people. We, I like seeing all these, man, there's a bunch of young guys, and I love that. Um, they are the next generation. So the average um, livestock uh, operator in the United States today, the average age right now is 69 years old, 69. So within the next 15 years, over 50% of the farms in the United States are going to be transferred to somebody. And if those young people aren't on board, don't have that skill level, you know, I think that's something, we've got a, a gap there that we need to start working on. But it's an exciting time to be in agriculture. I really believe that. Everybody, you know, if you get into this mainstream, the doom and gloom of everything going on, it can really depress you. So I'm gonna challenge you all, don't let that happen to you. Everything that you see in life, just, it's always the glass is half full. You gotta have that optimism, because if you, Get into this thing, well, you know, Bob's against me, Mary's against me, the government's against me, the county's against me. Pretty soon you can't think. And you just get this feeling like, well, why even try? You don't know. There's a lot of things that are going goofy today, but it doesn't matter. Only control, focus on the things that you can control. I'll give you that little tip. Focus on the things that you can control. And everything that you do does make a difference in the world. Everything positive that you do makes a difference. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I can't, I can't uh, change what's happening. Well, you can change what's happening to your daily life. And I'm a big proponent on that. So, uh, you know, Jan and I, we started out, uh, you know, we just started leasing land and then uh, we started custom grazing other people's cattle because we didn't have any money to buy our own animals. And now today, uh, we are debt free. Uh, we own all of our animals and we've both been able to, well, I quit my job at 50 in town and Jan just retired, but 
I think you've got to set goals, and we're going to talk about some of that too. You know, setting goals and how to reach some of those goals. But it sounds like we have a pretty diverse group here. I mean, there's people that are kind of work with dairy. There's pigs. The guy on the back's chickens. People wanting to get into cows and sheep. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So. Um, so the pros and cons, um, we're going to start out this morning first on the pros, the pros of multi-species grazing. Um, number one, multi-species tells us what? We have diversity. And so anything in nature that is single species, whether it's animals or plants, it will break down. If we have an orchard and all we have in there is apples and there's nothing but trees with bare soil between them. People like to keep that thing clean and bare. You're going to have pests. Uh, it's the same way in pasture. If you just have a pure pasture, Kentucky 31, not even like this, uh, even Kentucky 31, that's not good on the animals. Now, you may not have as much problem with army worms. In our area, army worms don't like Kentucky 31 very well. So you won't have the army worms, but you won't have good performance on your livestock. So once you bring one companion plant into fescue, it turns into be pretty good forage. Um, if you're running a cover crop, we found out now in the last you know, 15, 20 years, the more cover crops you put in together, the more root systems you have down there, they all source minerals and they, they make uh, root exudates and they trade with each other. Certain like brassicas are, are, more, are, are better at you know, sourcing and making uh, fungi, you know, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Folks, we don't have enough fungi in our soils. I mean, it's lacking big time. Um, we need to work on that. And uh, the cover crops can help on that, um, bringing in, you know, just good management. So uh, we're trying to replicate nature at our best. That's what we're doing. And so multi-species, it just adds, it harvests more dollars and folks, we as farmers, we're supposed to feel guilty if we make a profit. It's, at the end of the day, it does come down to dollars. We have to make a profit or we can't stay on our farm. So we need to not feel guilty about it. And a lot of farmers feel guilty if they make money. So guilty that they'll go spend it just so they don't have to pay taxes. Um, and that, that, that builds up on you. So. Is it a weed? If it harvests solar energy, is it a weed? A weed is there for, what, why is that weed there, Caleb? Why is the weed there in our pastures? Cover the soil. Cover the soil, that's right. And so Mother Nature will pick out a weed that's suited to that soil deficiency. So in our case, you know, years ago, the soybean field that we took over, it needed cockleburs. <laughs> Mother Nature put the whole thing into cockleburs. And those cockleburs are working on trying to rejuvenate that soil. I wasn't too crazy about them, but that's what she had there. And so I had to work with that. Um, sometimes you'll see a whole infestation of Canadian thistle. You know, it's there working on the soil for you. Um, there's a big push now. Everybody's getting excited about the uh, bull nettle, or some people call it horse nettle. This time of year, you'll see it all over your pastures. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's, it's a species and nettles, they are not competitive like cockleburs are. They have a little bitty leaf. They're not gonna crowd out a lot of solar energy. They're not as competitive as say cockleburs. So I don't even get excited about them. I, I mean, we have a few nettles, but to me, nature put that nettle there for a reason. So. I guess that what I'm saying is don't get focused on the weeds. If you're focused on managing weeds 100%, that's all you're going to have for the rest of your life is weeds. You've got to focus on what you want. And we're going to talk about that. <laughs> got to focus on what you want. So problem plants, if certain plants, now horse nettle, goats will eat that, but our sheep kind of nibble at the leaves when it's tender. But other than that, they don't met monkey with it. But some of those problem plants can become food. Uh, and, you know, Sri Celestes, we talk about that one. We've got, you all have got that down here, don't you, Ceresia? <laughs> that guy's smiling. Like, he's had some experience with it. It is a nasty one. And uh, Ceresia <clears throat> likes a monoculture. It'll come in 
and sericea has a lot of tannin in the leaves. And when that tannin drops off on the ground, it makes that soil conducive just to sericea. It'll kill out the other plants. But sericea is also a favorite of sheep. Sheep will eat it. Our cattle, uh, if you've just got cattle, you're going to have trouble probably uh, getting any use out of it. So what we went in on a Sericea Lespedeza fields, the ones that are really bad, if we can't get sheep in there, we'll mow them off. And you mow off Sericea Lespedeza and you mow it fairly short, like down to four inches, three to four inches. I call that short. And when it grows back, it's some of the best cattle feed you've ever seen. It's tender and the cattle will eat it and they like it and they do well on it. it it comes back real tender. Now, in Missouri, I'm going to give you dates. You've got to adapt that date to your region. But in Missouri, that would be about the third week of June. It gets about that tall, and the cattle just don't like it. But you mow that stuff off, and on your next rotation, boy, you got some really good forage there. Cattle are going to eat the heck out of it. And, and they'll do well on it. It's, it's actually almost as high a protein as alfalfa. It's that good got a deep tap root, it can take heat, it can take drought. And so I'm not gonna spray it and kill it. All my neighbors are like, Greg, you need to spray that. You need to spray. Everything they see, they, well, you gotta spray that. And I'm like, if you get in that mentality, you want to kill everything, pretty soon, do you all know that for every critter on your farm, the bad ones that are chewing, like I'm talking about pests, like if you got a, a corn borer, or whatever. You've got a, a pest out there and you spray him. You've killed 1,700 beneficials. For every bad pest, there are 1,700 good ones. That's directly from Jonathan Lundgren, the, probably the leading plant or the insect specialist in the United States. And Jonathan's been warning people, hey, look, we're going to wipe out the pest. We're going to wipe out all these insects. We're not going to have any natural predators left. So when the, the pests do come in, we don't have any predators there to eat them because we've killed them all. So don't do that on your farms, guys. Ladies, don't do that. If you start spraying, you're going to be killing some things that you, you're going to need down the road, and then you're going to have this massive something come in and just wipe you out, and it's because you don't have any predators. You've killed them. So... I like to control brush, uh, you know, the, the control, the brush and the weeds, that's, that's what we're talking about. Sheep, goats, uh, solar powered versus fossil fuel. I like to use solar powered vehicles. Now, we do own a tractor now, but for 35 years, no, it's 40. For 40 years, I didn't have one. I made do with that. And uh, I finally bought one. We got a sawmill now. I needed a way to get the logs to the mill. Uh, at least that's what I told my wife. That's why we bought it. So, um, mowing does not control the problem. Plants do. The, the animals do. So you could, that's what happened to us on our lifetime lease. So we've got a lifetime lease now on a farm. And the owners would come up every summer and they spend their whole week. They'd go rent a tractor and a brush hog. They'd mow the whole farm. And the next year they came back to like, where'd we mow? They couldn't tell it. It was worse. Each year it kept getting worse. And that's because there wasn't animals on it. So you can mow until your wheels of your tractor fall off. You're not going to control the problem. You've got to have animals and they're helping you. So you mow that stuff off and it comes back vegetative. Boom. You need to have your fencing and your water. We're going to talk about that. So there's so many things that the multi-species of animals help us with on our farm. Um, leaves removed. So... Any plant, I'll give you a uh, good example, honey locusts, honey locust trees, which are the thorny ones. They don't do so well with sheep because sheep, that is their favorite number one food item is a fresh honey locust tree about that tall. They just strip them. They just take all the leaves off. And in about two years, every honey locust tree is dead. They'll kill them dead. And that's without any tordon or all this other stuff that you can put on them to spray them. Um, if you're, if you're going to control thorny or woody stuff on your farm and you want to get rid of it, uh, animals can do that. But if you want to get rid of it quicker, it takes a little more labor for sure and more money. You can cut those off. I'm talking about, you know, thorn trees like this. And our landowners, we have several of them. 
some of them don't want us to grow those honey locust trees. And for us to keep the lease, we have to control those. And so we go out there and we'll actually cut those right when we cut them, we paint the stump. And uh, we use uh, one gallon, I'm sorry, one quart of crossbow to five gallons of red diesel fuel. And we mix it in a five gallon bucket and put a lid on it. And then we go out to do our, our cutting we'll have a gallon can with a paintbrush in it, and that's what we, we paint the stumps as soon as we cut them. If you're gonna paint a stump on a, a multiple rose bush or a thorn tree or any unwanted tree that you don't want out there, you've gotta paint it within three hours of cutting it. If you wait longer than three hours, don't even bother, cut, don't even bother painting it, because you're not gonna kill it. What happens is when you cut that tree, the, uh, the sap in that tree starts receding down to the tip of the roots immediately. And when you put that brush coat on there, it's pulling it with it right down to the tips. And I mean, it's done. I hate using any kind of brush killer, but we, that's another reason I'm not certified organic. That's a tool in our toolbox. I don't use it very much, but if we're building new fence and we just leased the farm that was three months ago, and um, it's got some fence on it and just ate up with honey locust trees. And we went in there and we cut those dudes because we had to put the fence in. I didn't want to recut them, <laughs> and they will. They'll come back mad. They come back with five, six, seven trees out of one stump, and then they got those big, long, nasty thorns on them. And so we 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 treated them and. Uh, I'm liberal with that brush killer. I want to see brush killer going down the sides of my stump, not just on the top, but on the sides. If it goes down in that bark, it, it gets them. And so I was out there last week looking to see what kind of control we got on them, and there's no sprouts coming up. I've got a nice clean fence, and the landowner, he's happy, I'm happy, and so it's a win-win. And that's why, be careful, don't, don't, uh, have somebody else telling you what to do on your farm. That's the biggest thing I have about organic is they tell you what to do. And I don't like that. I don't like people telling me what to do, especially on my land. And then I gotta pay them to tell me what to do. <laughs> Sounds like somebody's taking money off the farm. Uh, multiple species of animals, all they do is they strengthen the whole. We're talking about the whole, everything, and that's what happens. Cattle and sheep, of course, they act as dead-end hosts for the parasites. And so the cattle can ingest the sheep parasite, and the sheep can ingest the cattle parasite. No problem. But now if you put goats and sheep together, and you run them as one flock, they share each other's parasites. And usually what happens is the goats get, it's harder to build a parasite-resistant goat than it is a parasite-resistant sheep. And so you're putting a whole lot of pressure on those goats. And you might end up with a bunch of really wormy goats if you're not careful. And the sheep can kind of take it. That's been our experience. Now, there's a, a good rule of thumb with goats. <clears throat> if you make them graze below their kneecaps, that's when you're gonna start getting parasites. If you make them graze above their kneecaps, you're not gonna get very many parasites because the parasites reside in that bottom layer of your forage. They're trying to keep out the sunlight. The sunlight cooks them. So, uh, pigs, they turn manure, which if you can turn that manure, we're talking about cattle manure. The pigs, you know, either fall on the cattle. We, uh, we used to run Tamworth pigs, and the Tamworth, that's what we started with, and they actually were running right in with the cows. They lived with the cows, they moved with the cows, and they loved plain in cow manure. They didn't eat it because the cow manure was all grass. So we weren't, we weren't feeding the pigs any grain at all. The pigs, the pigs had to make it on clover. That's what they ate, clover, and acorns, and whatever was out there. Snakes, anything that moved, a pig would eat it. Um, but the pigs liked to play in it. And we didn't have wallers. We didn't have a lot of wallers. And pigs in the summertime need to keep some kind of moisture on the skin when it's really hot, especially if there's lack of shade, they've got to have shade. Um, anyway, they would roll in that manure. And when they did and, and root through it, they were turning it. 
that kills the parasites, the, the flies, because you've got all these maggots in those fly, in the manure pads, and the pigs really worked on that. Of course, chickens, they ingest the fly larvae, they'll pick through the cow pats. Uh, the animals that we're focused on right now is cattle, sheep, <clears throat> goats, guardian dogs, pigs, chickens, and wildlife. So we're trying to bring all those in. Um, right now, <clears throat> we're basically cattle, sheep, guardian dogs, and wildlife. Uh, we had a, a married couple that was living on the farm. They were doing the pigs and the chickens. Uh, Isaac, our full-time guy, he's getting interested in pigs. We'll see where that goes. But you've got to, for a centerpiece, we call it the mothership. What is the mothership of your farm? We're going to talk quite a You'll hear that term a lot. You've got to find out what that is. What is the profit center of your farm? Which animal is that? Okay. And also it helps if the mothership is the one that you like the best. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, uh, that's the one that you should really feel charged about when you wake up and you want to 